Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 12th episode of Game Changer Sessions. Uh, it's great that you all could be here. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, uh, Game Changer Sessions is a weekly live stream where we bring uh, brilliant minds and really warm hearts to share one of two things, either how do we thrive during these uncertain and exponential times, or how do we think about creating the future we want uh, during these times? Uh, we've had some amazing guests. We've had uh, Albert Wenger, a great venture capitalist, Julie Hanna, a partner at Obvious, Stephen Kotler, a flow expert, Minister Baines, our uh, innovation minister, all sharing some wisdom with us. And today it is with real pleasure and it's a great honor to have one of Canada's top venture capitalists, uh, and I would say global, globally one of the top venture capitalists, uh, Boris Wirtz, who is a founding partner of Version One. Uh, Boris is from Germany, but he's based in Canada. And um, he is a investor who's really focused on network effects and marketplaces. I have had the pleasure of actually being in a portfolio company that Boris has invested in, which is uh, Wattpad. I've co-invested with Boris uh, in, a few in, a, in one deal in particular, which is called Cape Privacy. And we are both a part of a great exponential tech uh, incubator, Creative Destruction Lab. Boris is super impressive. He's a board partner from Andreessen Horowitz, and he also sits on the boards of Canada Learning Code, as well as um, Science World. And Boris is not just an investor, he was an entrepreneur who sold his company to Amazon, a marketplace company, and we are delighted to have him here talking about the future post COVID. Welcome, Boris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Uh, how are you doing? Excellent. It's unfortunately a rainy day in Vancouver, but uh, otherwise, uh, summer is near. Uh, we'll we'll get some sunshine as well. I know. Well, it doesn't look rainy. Uh, you're, you're glowing in a good way uh, from your office there, so that's <laughs> good. And uh, actually, I said a, an interesting word. Uh, we were talking earlier, and it sounds like you're sitting in your office. Is this a, a new thing that you're back at work? No, not really a new thing. I've been coming into the office uh, every every few weeks or so just to pick up uh, some mail and, and, and things I really could only do in the office. But yeah, I've been working from home pretty much now for, for three months with a few interception, interruptions like this one. Mm. Uh, but yeah, sometimes <laughs> it's exciting to go back to the office, even though it's completely empty behind me and it's just me in the for office sure. right now. For sure. Well, I'm really delighted to have you uh, on Game Changer Sessions. Uh, and one of the things I'm so excited about is you're just an investor who I think has an uncanny ability to sort of figure out what's next. And you've been doing this for a long time. And there's three areas that you know I want to focus on and really get sort of your take on sort of what's coming in the areas of the future of work, the future of money, and the future of learning. Uh, three areas I'm really interested in, and I think we can have a really rich conversation around. Um, and then, you know, obviously you're really focused on marketplaces and network effects, and I think that space is changing a lot, so we can dive deep into that. And of course, on Game Changer Sessions, we're really interested in how we think about tech, not just to create the future, but actually the one we want. And so we'll dive into what that looks like for you. So starting uh, with work and you being in an office as the only person who's there, let's uh, talk about that. You know, what do you see as some of the biggest shifts in the future of work uh, for you and uh, your portfolio companies? So I think the first thing that is just remarkable to remind all of us like three months ago we just had a kind of office culture that was prevalent for everybody, right? And we made this incredible experiment to shifting everybody who could work from home, right? And, and almost everybody in tech can, uh, to work from home from lit in literally within days and weeks, right? And mm -hmm. it is kind of amazing to see how that uh, has worked and how quickly it has shifted. And it has shifted in such a way that now a lot of tech companies are declaring remote first um, um, culture and kind of don't even think about an office centered culture anymore. 
Um, I think the thing that we still need to kind of figure out uh, is how actually can this work from home thing or remote first thing actually work over a longer period of time um, and, and not in this special circumstance? Because I think there's two things that we shouldn't underestimate. The first one is um, everybody had to do it in the last two or three months, right? So it, mm -hmm. it was kind of this big group, group effort Nobody even doubted it, if it made sense or not, um, and how quickly it was implemented. And then secondly, the way I always think about it, it also worked so well because we already had these really um, strong relationships in place before and with our coworkers. We already had really good product roadmaps um, uh, uh, kind of worked on beforehand, creative processes that, that designed these. Um, we already have a, you know, most companies a really strong culture build, right? And you can certainly live off all of these things for a few months, but at some stage you need to kind of uh, replenish uh, all of those things, right? And that's going to be much tougher to to do in a virtual environment, a work from home environment, right? And so sure. um, I think two things need to happen. First of all, there will be some elements going back to the office uh, and then secondly we need to figure out better tools better processes to actually enable um, these 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 things that kind of usually happen in real life happen virtually as successfully as before mm -hmm. but the jury uh, is is certainly out on on, on that yeah, I, I love what you said. I mean, the, the discoverability, right, like element of finding new people, new collisions, new ways of, you know, getting ideas, et cetera, is really limited in a virtual environment. Um, and then, you know, to your point, it's what's the, the persistence of, you know, virtual work? What's the impact on on everything, on the culture, on mental health, on you know family dynamics. Uh, I'm really curious. And so, when you think about investing in the future of work, are there companies that you think um, are you seeing companies in these areas uh, that are addressing that, or do you think these things are intended for in real life? As a, you know, I, I think you used an acronym IRL, which I just loved. Uh, you know, can these things happen virtually? So I'm, I'm not sure if I have fully formed a thesis on that. I mean, first of all, mm -hmm. um, there have been a bunch of work from home companies and tools even before COVID, right? Um, Tandem, for example, is, 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 is one of them. Um, but a bunch of, and you know, certainly like think about Zoom and Slack, they weren't really in, 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 a, in a certain way work from home companies, but certainly enable work from home now at scale when we all started to to uh, spend more time at home and on the office, right? Um, so I think a bunch of these tools had already, uh, were already there and we have a few remote first companies that have used these tools beforehand, right? And experiment with mm -hmm. them. Um, I think none of that, all of them, let's put it that way, all of them always had very important in real life um, rhythm to building culture. So they, they brought together their, their teams on a quarterly basis. They still had uh, in, an office element for some parts of the teams, um, so for example, product management, et cetera. So I think we will we'll need, to, need to figure out um, how much the existing tools can actually scale. Do we need new tools or will it just be the way that there's a, just a bunch of things that just need to happen in person and they, they can never be replaced um, by a tool, right? So I'm, I'm not fully, uh, fully convinced in, in one way or the other. What I know right now is just like everybody is focusing so, so strongly on work from home and kind of work from home tools that I think the, the, the immediate investment opportunity is probably um, not there. It's just a very, very noisy space uh, with a lot mm -hmm. of capital and a lot of time that is being spent on that. Um, so probably not something we would invest in right now. Interesting. So sort of the counter to because everyone's there, you're not interested. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, in it's just end, too noisy. Yeah, I mean, I think right now it's just there's a few obvious categories that have benefited from that. And, you know, investors very quickly tend to kind of jump on these and double down on these, both in the early stages and, and the late stages. And um, that that tends to not necessarily be the best um, you know, kind of ways to spend your money 
uh, and invest. Sure. So uh, it's certainly so, so not, it's not the non-obvious choice right now. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about what you are interested in investing in in the future of work. I know you're a really big SaaS investor and recently you sort of framed up uh, a few areas that you think are interesting in B2B SaaS or things that you would look for. Can you talk a bit more about your viewpoint on the future of SaaS? You know, is there still a lot more runway there? What interests you? Uh, has COVID been a force function for any areas in SaaS? Yeah, so I think the, the the one thing that is really interesting is I think everybody, if you take a step back, everybody has really underestimated the potential of SaaS, right? And in the beginning, you know, I, I remember us looking at um, a, a bunch of vertical SaaS tools and like, oh, listen, you know, that looks like a small market, right? Or this looks like a feature, um, and there's just not such a massive market for it. And I think what, what really generally has been underestimated is just how large these markets are because just the, the removal of friction in, in, in distribution plus global markets plus every company needing to be a tech company and needing to kind of um, innovate on, on the product uh, and not necessarily having the resources, the development resources to do that. I think it just has um, increased the amount of opportunity for, for SaaS in particular that, you know, I think we all have, have underestimated in the, in, in the past. Um, but when you think about concrete opportunities, um, I still think there is, there is three big ones that we focus on. The first one is there's still a lot of not so great mobile first experiences in SaaS. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's something that um, kind of needs to be reinvented. Um, as people spend, continue to spend more and more time on, on mobile and it's a great wedge into, in, into the market. I think the second thing is a lot of SaaS 1.0 tools were kind of one way um, SaaS tools in terms of very little collaboration built in, very little data sharing sure. built in. Um, and I think um, in, in the same way that we've seen, for example, social networks become much more two way uh, conversations than just pure broadcasting tools. You're going to see SaaS tools kind of become much more two-way uh, collaborative. So we, we still think there's a bunch of opportunity in, 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 in that space. And then last but not least, I think there's a bunch of vertical SaaS opportunities that still uh, you can still go go after um, and, and, and nail. A um, bunch of verticals have been taken and, 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 and people have built great products for those, but there's still a, a, a bunch left, especially when you think about emerging areas and emerging platforms, uh, you know, Shopify and, and retail in, in general feels like sure. one opportunity that is, that is uh, quite, quite interesting. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, one of the things that seems to be, you know, the biggest most impacted is retail and the rise of e-commerce and we're even just in the few months we've seen how e-commerce has taken off you know what kinds of platforms marketplaces tools are you looking at in the the e-commerce landscape uh at version one what you know where's the the pain points yeah so we have um two investments in that space already shippo is one of them shippo is a api marketplace that connects Mm -hmm. um, shippers on the one side, so smaller e-commerce retailers or offline retailers that need shipping services with all of the carriers out there, uh, global network of, of carriers. And then secondly, we have a company called Dolly that has um, built up a network of, um, a delivery network of, for heavy items like furniture and, and other heavy items uh, across North America. And I think both of those companies have seen incredible interest uh, through the kind of the rise of e-commerce through COVID in the last um, two or three months. Um, and, and mostly driven in, in both of these cases, but by a lot more offline retailers that never really had an online presence uh, coming online and now suddenly needing to figure out how to survive as a business, how to um, extend the offline business into online. Uh, and that has really been um, a, a, a tremendous growth driver for both of these companies. Um, everybody suddenly, you know, thinking about, um, you know, shipping uh, nationally or even globally 
and and a lot of the local retailers thinking about uh, you know kind of how can I have local delivery enabled um, by by delivery networks like Golly. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really interested in Shippo in particular. I know uh, I think Union Square Ventures is also an investor in it. And um, you know, since you are you know really at the the forefront of marketplaces and sort of the evolution of marketplaces, uh, you recently wrote a blog post around API as a marketplace, and you mentioned Shippo as an example. Can we talk a little bit more about sort of some of the evolving trends in marketplaces and specifically what you mean by API as a marketplace? Because I was really curious about that. Yeah. So my, my partner, Angela, came up with that term API as a marketplace. And when you think about we, we've seen for the last um, you know, five to eight years, like the rise of APIs as a way of having a much a um, more efficient way of accessing code um, and building mm -hmm. experiences by accessing information or code uh, in um, um, uh, for, for, for coders, for developers. And, you know, we, we've seen like the plates of the world for financial information, Stripe for payment um, or, or also Shippo for, for shipping services. I think a lot of these um, APIs, Twilio is another example, kind of commoditize the underlying layer, right? And it doesn't really matter, you know, for Twilio, it uh, makes it really, really easy to build a telecommunication app, uh, a mobile app, et cetera, and have these services integrated. But the, the, the underlying layer is pretty commoditized. Now, the idea of an API as a marketplace is the, the supply layer is actually differentiated, right? And we have one company that we invested in, in, in this theme of APIs marketplace called Patch Technologies, which mm -hmm. is um, providing a marketplace for carbon offset. So underneath the, uh, the, the API on the supply side, they have kind of a, a whole range of carbon offset projects that are being evaluated, they're unique, they have certain characteristics, and then they make them available for anybody to integrate them into their e-commerce experiences to enable carbon offsets, right? And so um, the idea of creating uh, a marketplace uh, that you can really access through an API, you can access supply through an API and integrate it, that, that supply wherever you want um, on, on the demand side is kind of an interesting one. And we continue to be very, very excited about that. And, and Shippo and Pasha are two of the examples in that, in that space. Yeah. I, I think that's super interesting uh, as it relates to how marketplaces are evolving. Um, I'm so conscious of time because I could take each one of these topics and we could go super deep in in just those. But let's let's move on. I mean, I think you know I've always been. Um, uh, aware that you've been one of the, the earliest investors in sort of the crypto ecosystem and blockchain. And I've, I've really enjoyed listening to you talk about the future of money. And something um, you said recently, which I thought was very relevant, is that this economic fallout of COVID from the COVID crisis in emerging markets is really going to drive digital currencies. And so, you know, you were right there in, in the earliest stages of V1 of this space. How is COVID a force function for the future of money and for blockchain in general? Yeah, I think what is what is really interesting is a lot of people focus on the U.S. market, right? And the Fed mm -hmm. printing a lot of money and saying, oh, this is going to be an inflection point for Bitcoin, right? Um, I think when you, when you look at the strength of the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy, I think we're far away from Fed action kind of creating a bunch of inflation and, and a flight to digital assets and digital currencies anytime soon. But I think what is happening in developing countries, and you see that already in Venezuela and now with Argentina um, and a bunch of others, is just these company, uh, these countries just don't have a Fed. Uh, they don't have a central bank that has the reputation and the resources to print money to fight the economic fallout of, of COVID. And hence, you're going to see a lot of currency crisis happening in developing countries, unfortunately. Um, and people will want to have access to uh, digital currencies. And uh, a lot of people think about Bitcoin in the first place. And that's certainly true. 
that there is a large interest, especially in Venezuela and, and Argentina and Bitcoin. But even more importantly, people are really interested in, in digital USDs, right? And you have a bunch of these stablecoin projects, US, USDC, USDT, et cetera, that have digitized the US dollar and make it super easy to actually access US dollars in a digital way. And we've seen a huge uptake of those stablecoin um, um, demand in developing countries. People want to own um, the US dollar, um, but they want to own it in a digital way, which is much, you know, much more frictionless uh, and easy to get. For sure. So, like uh, thinking about it as a store of value is is clearly, you know, I think you met you you made a very good point that it's kind of hit product market fit in that way, and you see that through stable coins, you see that through Bitcoin. I know you're really early in Ethereum, and you know you you've come up. Um, the idea of decentralized finance and sort of thinking about Ethereum as uh, playing a role in other elements of finance um, is something you've been, you know, talking a lot about recently. Can you um, elaborate on that? And you know, I'm really interested in one of the companies that I, I believe you're an investor in, which is the the people-owned insurance company, the mutual fund. I, I'm just trying to remember what it's called. Yeah, uh, Nexus Mutual. Nexus Mutual. Uh, that, that was an idea I had you know, two years ago. I was like, this just makes so much sense for people-powered uh, you know, insurance, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of companies in finance that you're seeing um, as it relates to Ethereum? Yeah, so, so first of all, I think that the idea of decentralized finance, what we're seeing right now is every single piece of the centralized finance system, right? Debt and equity and options and derivatives and insurance is getting rebuilt in a decentralized way, right? And um, I think there is um, three big um, um, advantages to that. Um, the first one is permissionless, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, very easy, you know, given you know, if, if you're in, into the Ethereum ecosystem to participate. And the second thing is this whole idea of the actually Lego blocks, Lego money blocks, right? Um, and meaning they can build on each other, right? And they're not separate protocols, separate products, but they really interact with each other through code. And there's like this, we, we talked about APIs before, it's just a massive API layer that can uh, create even more powerful products by interacting with, with each other. And then mm -hmm. last but not least, and these projects have also a, a just complete different approach how participants can actually benefit from them and how they can get involved, right? And that could be on governance. So, um, people that own these tokens and are part of these these protocols can vote in it. They can earn fees from it right, by participating. Um, they can just benefit uh, from it by by holding these these tokens, right? And so you have everything on the one hand side, like something like Nexus Mutual that is really set up as a uh, decentralized autonomous organization around insurance and an insurance mutual and making it easy to aggregate literally hundreds of investors hundred that, that provide capital to then uh, organize um, kind of insurance cover uh, for the community. Uh, and, you know, Mutuals have been around since a long period of time and this is not a kind of completely new idea, but it's certainly much easier to execute on than it has ever been before. Um, and, and so you, you get these new forms or organizations in the decentralized finance uh, area, which is super exciting. It's still early, um, yeah. and uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll see how long it will take to really uh, go over to the mainstream. But what we've seen in terms of developer interest, the innovation that space is just very exciting. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, I just want to encourage people who are on our. Uh, on our live stream. If you have questions uh, for Boris, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will get to them at about 1.45. So looking forward to seeing your questions. Uh, so moving on, um, you know, the future of money, we could definitely spend more time here, but I wanna move to the future of learning. Cause one, it's an area I'm super passionate about and I know you're on the board of Canada Learning Code and Science World. And not only that, you have four kids at home, uh, all who are having 
having, you know, experiences with learning. So, you know, just at the high level, you know, what is your sort of viewpoint around what COVID has taught us around learning experiences virtually? I think COVID has really taught us two things. The first one is schools can be much more flexible than we thought, right? And, uh, you know, we had really great experience with our schools moving from an offline schooling to an online schooling uh, within literally weeks and super impressive effort, right? Something that didn't feel feasible beforehand. But it, I think it also has taught us how 1.0 these online learning experiences are. And, and given there was not enough time to kind of develop new tools, but ultimately it's really a, a matter of um, tools we used before, um, and kind of Google Docs, et cetera, and then a Zoom video call. And so I think there's tremendous amount of potential to really unlock much better digital learning experiences that are really two-way, um, not just somebody, a teacher on Zoom giving a lecture, um, but almost no questions being possible. Um, also, you know, kind of people might be like students have, have different comfort levels of asking questions in front of a whole group. Um, Enabling all of these experiences, very personalized, I think there's a tremendous amount of, of, of opportunity. And I really think right now we're in kind of online education 1.0 in the same way that, uh, and I gave that example before, uh, when you think about some of the first um, online experiences in the internet, they were literally pure copies of the offline world. Uh, literally translated one-to-one -one into online. And it feels like this is exactly where we are in terms of online education right now. Yeah, I, I would definitely tend to agree. What's been the experience for your kids personally? Have, uh, have they engaged in, um, you know, any, any new or interesting learning experiences that you've sort of seen or found or still, you know, as you say, 1.0 on a personal note? Yeah, so, so I think two things. First of all, I think it always depends a little bit on the teacher. Um, we have sure. some teachers that have just incredibly stepped up and provided a super fun virtual environment. Uh, I, I almost felt they were better as kind of online teachers than they were as, as offline teachers comparatively. Um, I think the biggest experience for our kids has just been be more uh, independent and uh, be more responsible, right? Ultimately, you know, in school, you really go from one lesson to the other and kind of in one, from one room to the other. And like, you know, you, you get fed the information and you, you have a very clear schedule of what to do. Suddenly there was way less of a schedule, right? Much more, what I would say, like almost close to university, you get a lecture, but then you have to figure out the rest for your assignment, et cetera which has been just a great learning experience for our kids. And, you know, the two older ones, 10 and 12, you know, they, they certainly had never been that independent beforehand. So they certainly struggled with in the beginning, um, but then found their footing. And we just look back, school just finished on uh, last Friday, and we look back and they both felt incredibly accomplished and proud that they had mastered that transition so, so nicely. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. That's that's super interesting. How do you think about the future of education just in terms of our society in general? So if you look at some of the stats, we're seeing, you know, unemployment rates at all time highs at all time highs. There's an unprecedented need for retraining in society. So there's a whole bunch of jobs, as you know, that are going to be you know, replaced by AI and, and machines and also ones that after this crisis aren't going to come back. And what we do know is that, you know, the societies that are best equipped for uncertainty are the ones with the most educated populations. So, you know, what do you think, um, you know, is going to shift or how do we shift, you know, our society to be better educated using uh, virtual tools? What, what are some of your thoughts there? Yeah, so, so I think w when you look at it, it's kind of astonishing now, it feels obvious right now, right? But you, you look at this learning need, right? And then you think about that we have never really figured out online learning per se. I mean, 
MOOCs perhaps being being one one example of you know having done a good job, but we, we haven't really figured out uh, online learning at scale. And so it feels like there's this tremendous potential uh, that we have to retrain population. You know, somebody, um, you know, a lot of people have pointed out in this whole um, crisis also like, you know, the, the universities like Harvard that have now switched to online. Why would you, if you don't have the physical limitations anymore, why wouldn't you just make that explode in terms of number of people you can teach, uh, you can train, you can educate at no more cost than before, right? And and um, so I'm incredibly hopeful that education will pl provide um, an incredible uh, accelerant of learning uh, going forward. And it's gonna be mostly digital because otherwise we will, we're not gonna be able to to be up to that task of, of retraining millions of people. So uh, I think there's tremendous amount of opportunities for entrepreneurs, but but even more importantly, kind of tremendous upside for, for all of our societies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the themes or trends that I'm seeing is sort of this hyper polarization, which is, you know, Ivy League brands like a Harvard or a Stanford getting more valuable over time. But the bulk of education institutions, you know, do you think they're going to survive? I mean, student debt levels today are at all time highs and the value uh, people are getting in society from the traditional you know, university institution feels like it's actually diminished unless it's a, an Ivy League school. So do you have a sense of, you know, how you see the industry playing out? It, it feels like it's probably ending up in the same way that um, e-commerce ended up in a certain way. You have on the one hand side, you have the large brands, the large platforms, the aggregators, right? Um, and we'll see if, any of the existing players can kind of um, get 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 to that space or not, and then on the other side you have um, the extremely um, specialized um, uh, experience learning experience, right? Where somebody um, provides a very specialized, you know, often on the job experience in a, in, in the same way which we always seen, for example, Lambda and and, and coding, Lambda School and coding. Um, where you really focus on a very specific job that you're training and perhaps couple up with an innovation, a business model in terms of an income sharing agreement, right? But my, my uh, guess would be there's not much in the middle, right? In, in terms of if you don't have a brand, you don't have to scale, you're not specialized, like why should you still exist? It's, it's like the retailer mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't really have that, uh, um, that, that exposure uh, or kind of that brand to be either, you know, you, you, they're not some of the aggregators, but they're also not specialized enough um, sure. and, and uh, um, individual enough. For sure. It feels like the newspaper industry, you know, in, in a similar context where that it, whole middle is completely yeah. wiped out, you I know. Uh, so I, I tend to agree for sure. Um, are there any areas that excite you about investing in the future of learning uh, in particular? You know, I think, as I said before, people that can figure out the two-way interactive piece much more than the one-way. Um, mm -hmm. When you think about MOOCs, for example, it's literally often digital lessons, right, that go one totally. way. Uh, when you think about what schools did, you know, given that they didn't really have many tools, but it was really one way again, right? But how does that integrated experience look like? And then it could be for, for kids, it could be in, in, um, in universities, it could be for adult learning, um, but how do you really leverage the tools um, so that learning is in, in, in both ways and super interactive and very personalized? Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense for sure. So I want to talk about uh, a topic that's, you know, very much uh, the reason in some ways for Game Changer Sessions, which is, 
you know, in tech, we have um, a lot of access and a lot of power to create the future. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're here to do. And something I'm very passionate about, and I know you are too, is not just creating the future, but actually creating a future that we want. And so, you know, when you think about creating the future that you want, what does that look like? What's involved in, in, a, in that future? Yeah, I, I think tech has a real opportunity to democratize access to knowledge, right? democratize access to healthcare, um, democratize access to finance, right? and and we need to kind of figure out uh, how tech can actually accelerate all of that, um, easier access to all of these things, right? And uh, um, I think. Um, there, there's a there's a bunch of platforms, a bunch of developments that are already um, super promising in that that way. We discussed a little bit about education, but you, when you think about um, commerce, for example, Shopify or the whole passion economy and platforms that support that, um, there's more and more um, of, of those products that really help um, everybody get get access to opportunity. Right. And, and that's really one of the, the areas I get incredibly excited about if, um, you know, we, we can just broaden access in all these areas um, through, through technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's in many ways the reason I, I sort of wanted to be in tech and certainly Wattpad's promise, you know, was to really give access and exposure to anybody who wanted to read and, and tell stories. So very aligned. So in that context, how do you think about what's happened in tech as it relates to sort of these uh, the fang stocks or sort of big tech and its role in society. You know what? What do you believe uh, should happen as it relates to big big tech's power, control, and role? Yeah, I think I think what we've what we've seen over the last decade play out is that the, the really powerful platforms they really control demand, right, and commoditize supply, and uh, this mm -hmm. could be content producers in, in the case of Google and Facebook, and this could be um, marketplace participants in the, in the context of, of, of Amazon. And you know, it, it has created very powerful monopolies in each of these areas uh, that are incredibly uh, defensible, that are incredibly profitable, but have not left a lot of opportunities for the people um, what sometimes people call like the people below the API, the people participating in these platforms and actually contributing to, to them. Right? And so I think there's, there's two high level ideas how to counter that, right? The first one would be you have more companies like Shopify that are on the side of the merchant of the, the, the small shop mm -hmm. Uh, and partnering them and, and really being the, the antithesis to controlling the customer, they really enable you to gain access to the customer, keep the customer, serve the customer, but give you the best tools to compete against the, 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 the big guys. I think the second theme is, and that's the theme that certainly crypto has, has pushed forward, is like, do we find um, platforms that can actually um, give some of the rake, some of the value that has been created by the platform back to these participants, right? And certainly, for example, by, based on their activity level, based on their contributions. And crypto and blockchain certainly provides a really good technical framework and platform to do sure. so, right? And so it's going to be sure. interesting to see how these things are going to play out, both in the non-crypto world, like more of the, the Shopify's of the world that are on the side of um of the creators and that could be you know Substack is another example for for newsletter mm -hmm. newsletter writers mm -hmm. uh and then as well as in kind of these completely new models in crypto and blockchain that inherently might uh, kind of um pay out some of the value to the the uh, participants absolutely i i'm i'm very hopeful um, around both of those uh, and, and feel it's just super needed that we 
use technology to enable sort of de democratic capitalism, basically, because what we're seeing is the polarization of wealth as opposed to the democratization of, we may be giving access and exposure, but democratization of wealth is kind of falling away from, from society with some of these tech platforms. Uh, so one of the things that I love that you said on Twitter recently, uh, and I'm very aligned with is, you've been focusing on this word kind and uh, you, you made a couple comments that really hit me, which is, you know, I, I think you said um, one of the kindest things you can do right now is put someone in a job, be it writing their first check or giving them their first job, be, giving them their first role. Let's talk a little bit more about kindness uh, as it relates to our tech ecosystem, which may sound weird, but I think it's really relevant, especially in these hard times. Tell me more about what you meant by that. Um, so, so a few things. I think what I've observed over the last uh, two, three months, I think stress levels have generally gone through the roof, right? And mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons, financial stress, um, health um, related, just the new working from home, online school, um, the new cycle. And what I've seen and I was really surprised um, is that people that I thought were pretty generally kind people starting to lash out at other people. Um, and, and I think it's just a super important reminder um, that, listen, it, it might be stressful times, um, but we really here uh, all together on the same um, boat, we need to figure it out. And, and I think you get usually much further if you're kind uh, and I think it's a much more productive atmosphere if everybody's kind to each other. Um, I think specifically on this, um, the kindest thing you can do to somebody uh, is kind of put them into business, like be it hiring them for the first job, writing a first check in their startup, um, okay, giving them the first promotion. Um, it really came out of the experience of my own uh, of my own investing activities where we often commit when we're the, 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 the first ones to see a startup we commit to around uh, we commit to a new fund for example of, of somebody that starts a new fund and um, years back um, you know these entrepreneurs will come back to us and say like oh my god like I still remember you were the first person that believed in me right and that gave me all the confidence to kind of take it over the finish line and continue and push forward, et cetera. And so since then, it's like, for me, it just felt like at the moment, not, not even that special. I was just convinced that this was a good investment. I didn't even realize the importance of me stepping up as the first person and kind of putting somebody in business, right? But I think mm -hmm. that feedback cycle really kind of made, made it clear to me how important it is, how big of a difference you can make when you're the first one that believes in somebody, right? And uh, I, I just think it's just super important and I wish like more people gain conviction on, on somebody that perhaps doesn't have the pedigree, doesn't have the track record, doesn't have the traction and they invested time and money uh, into that person to kind of get them to the next level. And uh, I, I just think it's an incredibly kind thing to do and and has like long lasting effects on the person that receives that kindness. Yeah, I, I echo that fully, both as, you know, an entrepreneur and an investor and somebody who's, you know, operated things, those that just belief in people, right, is, is something like even if you don't have a check, right, just actually verbalizing your belief in someone yeah. uh, is so powerful, right? Uh, be it your kids or your colleagues or, you know, people who need help right now, just that that being seen and heard in, in terms of their talent. So uh, thank you. I think that's uh, super powerful. So I'm super aware that we have lots of questions um, that uh, the community has wanted to ask you. So let's hop over to the questions. Um, the first question I have um, is really from here. Uh, one second. Let's do this one. Um, you know, uh, going back to the future of money, uh, we have a question here from Ron, which is, what do you think, what is the impact of decentralized financial systems on the governments of developing countries? Uh, 
That, that, it's, a very, it's a very good question. <laughs> good question. It's also a very <laughs> complex question, right, uh, to, to, to answer. And uh, you, you can certainly have two answers to that. I mean, uh, let, let's, let's start with a positive one. I think a positive one would be um, kind of the, the, the less a government influences the financial system, the more access open the access to that financial system, the more, more innovation can happen and there, there, there shouldn't be as much discrimination against certain, certain groups of people in the financial system, right? Um, having said that, um, you know, we, we've seen it certainly in, in, uh, in, in other ways, if change happens too quickly, it can also have negative, um, a very negative um, consequences. So, you know, as, as always, technology can be good and can be used for bad. Um, I, I sincerely hope that in this case, it's, it's going to be uh, much more positive than anything else. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so another question we have here is, um, are we observing the unbundling of non-core Amazon services during the pandemic? For example, Stripe seems to be replacing Amazon payments. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, Stripe has been around since a long period of time, right? And, uh, and, and done incredibly well uh, all, all, all along that. Amazon payments has never really taken off. Um, I think the way I would think about it is Amazon is just a classical aggregator that has incredible consumer mind share in everything that is within the Amazon uh, ecosystem um, is, is optimized for that. But what we've seen is actually all these tendencies of people wanting to build experiences and products outside of aggregators, independent of aggregators, because these aggregators certainly take, as we, we just discussed, a very high rate, a very high fee, very high margin out of everything, out of the value they're creating. And so the Shopify's of the world, the, the, the Stripes of the world, um, the Twilies of the world, they all enable companies to build experiences outside of the aggregators and trying to get uh, become an aggregator themselves or kind of get, getting to a point where they have consumer mind share and con consumer connections, right? So, so I don't think it's as much as um, there's an unbundling of Amazon services, but I think there's a general a tendency that people are more interested in tools that help them build um, businesses outside of the aggregators like Facebook and Google and, and Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so going to online education, uh, Brad Carter, uh, he, is, he asked the question, you know, COVID has really, he makes the comment first, he says COVID has exposed um, the fact that we're not really equipping people for the future we want. And everybody is in a huge rush to get back to normal, especially as it relates to education. Um, are you seeing or, or how do you think schools uh, should be focusing on um, actually creating the future we want? Are, are, are you seeing anything in that regard on actually changing the system? Yeah, and, and so I think that's a very good question and, and one I've been thinking about quite a bit. When you think about work from home, right, once offices are open, we, we're going to partly swim back, right? Some companies will fully swing back, but some companies will kind of, swing back halfway. Um, and so they continue to invest in virtual experiences um, because um, parts of the company still will work from home. In schools, especially K-12, that's gonna be a little bit different, right? It's hard to imagine a, a school that is half virtual on some days or virtual on some days and, and in real life on other days, right? And so, the fear I certainly have is as we go back, everybody gonna forget about all of that, right? We go back to fully in real life again, and there's just no incentive to further develop virtual experiences because we, we went back to the, to the old way of, of doing things. So I'm probably more hopeful that we continue 
to develop virtual experience for work from home, remote working, than I am for, for education, especially K to 12, because that feels like really a binary model of either you're there in person or you do it all online, but not much in between. And, and so that's going to be the tricky thing to figure out. Will there be experiences um, that, that push forward the virtual experience? But it could be, for, ex for example, around homeschooling, right? So you have, for example, OutSchool, um, a, mm -hmm. a network for, for homeschooling, tools and teachers, et cetera. Perhaps that's the way how we're going to... Um, going to push it forward. It's not the, the schooling system, but um, most students will go back to schools full time, but there might perhaps be just a much bigger population of homeschooling um, students and, and those kind of will, will drive forward virtual uh, experimentation. Yeah, absolutely. I, have, I don't know if you've tried out school yet, but I, I have. And I think, you know, one of the things is I believe innovation usually happens on the edge, you know, and that's kind of what you're seeing with the the homeschoolers um, and, and some of the yeah. new virtual summer camps that are popping up for sure. Uh, so my last question, I just think is an important one, especially in terms of what's going on, you know, in the world and specifically talking about um, how we create a more fair and just society. And, and obviously the past few weeks have been, you know, rife with, you um, uh, a climate where we're really recognizing uh, the systemic racism that exists in, you know, not just the U.S. but in Canada as well. And, you know, you made a comment on Twitter that I thought was really interesting, which you said, you know, one thing that keeps you hopeful is that there's never before been this many people who are talking about race and sort of taking some action or caring about um, racism, and that especially this is happening in the younger populations, what, what can we do in the tech community and innovation community, do you think, to, to create a more accessible and, um, uh, you know, uh, environment uh, and one that is, you know, has more diversity? Yeah. So I think there's a few things. I think the first one is really coming back to that comment I made on Twitter. I think further understanding, deeper understanding of the real issues, right? And um, it was really interesting and, and kind of a, an incredibly powerful moment for myself. Um, I, uh, I attended a webinar from um, some uh, investors that some investors put on um, that were investors of color. Right? And there was this really powerful story of a, of a person that worked for a top tier fund that had moved from, from Toronto to the Valley, back to the Valley. And literally within a few minutes of him walking from to back to his hotel the, mm -hmm. the, the, the cops got onto him um and asked him just because somebody had called the cops right and it really hit home for me because i had stayed in that hotel i had walked on that on that uh, street uh, i'm an investor myself the same age so everything was so comparable in terms of how i had experienced that specific location and that specific action, um, and you know similar backgrounds and 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 jobs, right? And that really hit home. And and you know for somebody that um, um, kind of probably doesn't see racism on a on a day to day basis, um, it was incredibly powerful for me for me to learn that. And I think like the more we really understand what's going on. Uh, and what's going on, why we don't see it, right? Um, I think that's really the, the, the first step. Anything hasn't made an incredible difference the last two or three weeks of people of, of, with all sorts of backgrounds um, stepping up and, and telling their personal stories. Um, I think the second thing is, um, I personally think that um, a lot of that needs to start way earlier than the question of, can we have more people of color, for example, being in an investment career um, tomorrow, right? I think it's really, how can we make sure that uh, young, very young people, right, have the same opportunities right, that, um, that everybody else has? And that comes back to what we said before about democratization of, of knowledge and of healthcare and fin finances, et cetera. It's going to be a long process, and, and tech certainly can only play uh, a limited role in that. But that feels to me 
it's not a matter of tomorrow kind of um, as important as it is hiring kind of running a more diverse hiring process right um, I think it's just much more important to um, and much more impact to really provide opportunities way way earlier and get people on the, the path where they can actually have these opportunities down the road yeah super helpful and super uh, relevant uh, conversation. So Boris, it's 155. I want to thank you so much for sharing such, uh, such profound insights into, you know, all things future of work, future of learning, future of money, and, uh, you know, just really love the warm heart that you have around the kindness factor too, and how we use technology to create the future we want. So thanks again for being on Game Changer Sessions. And, uh, Everyone, I just want to uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been a great show. Uh, quick thank you to our production partner, Either Live, uh, executive produced by Corey Marr, and with special thanks to Marone Tadas. This is Marone's last week, so a big thank you and shout out to her for all the amazing work you've done. And we have great partners for the show. We have CBC Toronto and CIX, Toronto Life, Talk Boutique, Artery, York University. A huge thank you for helping us bring these great conversations with such brilliant minds and warm hearts like Boris to the community. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.